uh, we should wear clothes which we feel more confident about. You know, you should, you feel good about yourself. You feel more confident. And, and that is what is all about, you know, you should, whenever you go somewhere, uh, you should be confident that, you know, I'm, I'm dressed well, I'm, you know, feeling good. And then it will show in your uh, conversations and your performances, like, and it, it opens up, basically. It opens up the individual. So I don't think a jacket is compulsory, not at all. But the reason why I am wearing jacket, just because I feel very confident when I de deal with people. That's all. So, fantastic. So, each one to his own. Uh, he likes wearing a jacket, he feels confident. My answer is, I feel no less confident if I'm not in a jacket. Close the back home at KPMG. Uh, we're in a starting organization. And if I had to go to the office in this dress, I would be thrown out. Yeah? I wear jackets Monday to Friday, five days a week. Right? I don't want to get up on a Saturday, come and meet people like them, but I wasn't sitting very long ago and wear a jacket. I take the liberty of not wearing one, and I feel equally comfortable in what I'm wearing right now. Right? Each one do his own, absolutely agree with you. The point I'm trying to make is, boundaryless, in a sense, is about doing what you feel like doing with no restrictions. Organization structures, culture, people, all of that will fall in place only if each one can do what they like to do. Setting that context, I like to move to my family. Koshik is with us. Koshik, would like to throw some light on your experience of what it takes to be a boundaryless organization. Yeah, thanks, Sahil. See, first of all, let us understand this gravity of uh, this particular discussion topic. Boundaryless organization, then we talk of digital, how we can break it. Uh, but it takes much more than that. Take thousands of years back, division of labor created a boundary. Today we call it caste. Then a good set of good meaning people started talking about philosophies. We created another boundary called religious boundaries. Then there are a set of people who wanted to champion the causes of common people. So what we made out of it? We created political boundaries. Today we have a whole lot of generations who are well educated, smart, on the mobile, digital savvy. Have we been able to break those shackles of caste, religious, politics to an extent? Practically not to an extent. So which means that the, today the topic that we have is extremely relevant and requires a lot of uh, understanding and clarity to see how we can bridge those gaps. So for an organization, what are those drivers of boundaries? First is obviously, it's very obvious one, it is a geography and the culture associated with it. For example, I'm based in India, someone based in US, different culture vis-a-vis -vis someone based in Europe. That is a very simple one and that is much easier to break today in a digital world. What is the second one? The second one is about the structure of the organizations. The functions, the departments, the divisions, it all creates boundaries within the organization. What is the third one? Me, my subordinates, and my manager. Those are called role-based boundaries. That creates another boundaries. So in organization, what happens? Because of certain necessity, we have to deal with boundaries. How we deal with boundaries depends on what kind of boundaries we want to break. Whether it's a geographic boundary, or a cultural boundary, or a role boundary, or a structural boundary. So there are many ways of doing it. So as we progress in this particular discussion, each one of us will try and address and talk about our experience and how different organization does it and what we can learn from it. Yes, I Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To make yourself a popular organization. The first and foremost thing is Sam's and Jesus came at four years back. The name was made for humans. Who else would you make it more for? The other dogs? So, employees are the change agents. Who? What else or which other thing will be the change agents? And it's the employees in the center. Only as a in an organization that appreciates everything that's at a different line, straight line, and other lines of the 
So, so it is a people that matter in every organization and it is people who make organizations. Sir, the point I'm trying to make is the boundaries are mostly, mostly mental. That's because when we, when we think of a team, we think it is never put on the same boss. That's not how it is. If one of you are a common object, no matter where you are, you are telling us. It could be a vendor, it could be a service provider, it could be a ground system, a whole line, back to work, all the way to the other side. The goal is to produce something or get something that much at all. So when organizations see that, so when I say organizations don't expect some HR to have a book and give it to you, organizations, when people start seeing if they keep you doing a common objective with the team, then the boundaries, at least the mental boundaries are the best. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much for that. Well, hey, you just come back with your course from this year. Of course, great learning, great faculty. From an academic perspective, let me throw some light to say, as kids, right, each one of us, right, as kids, we were told, don't go there, don't go far away. Go to the deep side of the swimming pool, you drown, right? We were all to contextually set your boundaries. And when we go to an organization, we're trying to say, let's be boundaryless. How do you cover that divide? Uh, for me, uh, the boundaryless uh, thing is all about mindset. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, right from our childhood, we create a lot of boundaries within us. Uh, our mental map is like that. Some cultures, like if you go to South Asian countries where you know very childhood you've been taught discipline, you have to think this way only. This is the way you do. Okay? Uh, the biggest example for me, a boundaryless organization is all travel bloggers, you know, travel bloggers. They are sitting in the sunny beaches of Thailand, uh, Alps Mountain, and then they're doing their business, sitting alone, writing blogs, earning money. So for creating a boundary less organization, first thing we need to create the mindset. And mindset right from school, right from the beginning itself. So if you have a bright idea, you can do the business the, your own way. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, Rick, you have the opportunity to work with multiple people across the globe, set up various organizations, multiple yep. countries. What's been your experience on the global landscape? to look at how uh, people perceive uh, boundaryless organizations, what's, what's the global landscape looking like? Sure. Okay, um, boundaryless organizations, you hear a lot of jargon in business and it goes round and round. Um, I've got to kind of start at the beginning. I've been mentored by two multimillionaires and a president of two airlines. So from the ripe age of 21 on, I've been running companies. So I knew the traditional views of what and the structure was and how companies think and leaders think. And if you're going to be successful, and I think that's what everybody's here today to do, it's to understand your position. You need to understand who you are. And there's leaders and there's followers. And you have to get rid of the followers idea. Because if you're going to fit into a boundaryless organization, you need to go in there and understand you take your position. And you have to take it. Because you're competing globally. You're competing with other people just like you around the globe who are also biding for that exact position in that organization. You see, the boundaries don't exist anymore. You're now competing with everybody. So we hire the best, okay? And I mean the best. So my organization, when I first started, I, I, most people thought I was a little bit crazy in the way I work. But I work 21 hours a day, seven days a week. I sleep between 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. That's it. This is boundaryless. You're committing yourself to time zones, people, and access to the best people. So the information that you get from these people, regardless of where they are and what it costs, I can move my company forward much faster than that one that's brick and mortar. You understand? So when you start getting into this space and you want to get into boundaryless organizations, although they do have their benefits, they also have their flaws. Because now you have to understand the type of person that you are. Are you a type A personality, B personality, C personality, D personality? And if you don't know what that is, an A personality is somebody who's a little aggressive, a leader. Uh, you're looking at a B personality, somebody a little 
little more passive, someone who's a little bit shy, maybe a little bit lazy and sometimes, not always, but sometimes. C is more of an introvert type person, they get the job done but they take a lot of pressure and D type personalities are just the followers, they get the job done, they do it according to the principles, policies and standards of an organization. You have to figure out who you are, but more importantly, you have to understand that you're going to, this thing's cutting out, you, you have to understand you're going to be working with every single one of these types of people. Because in every aspect of an organization, whether it's finance, whether it's marketing, whether it's organizational structure, it's all going to remain the same. It's just where are these people coming from? Boundaryless organizations are predominantly based on people. And they don't require the brick and mortar that they used to. So you can build billion dollar companies overnight by getting the best talent, the most clear information. I can hire a CEO of a bank to do a paper for me and I can have it in an hour and a half. If I hire an entire team, it may take six months to get them online. You understand? So you're only as good as the information that you know and your expertise. So develop your expertise and that's thinking like a CEO. You'll understand every compartment of an organization, you understand how to bring it all together, and you understand the requirements of how a CEO builds things. So come back to the traditional idea of what transition is. We have people, processes, technology. If you understand those elements and you're always focused on them, you're adding value to what he's trying to create. If you don't know those things, stay in school a little longer. Because that is the most important thing to a CEO. It's about growth. It's about revenue generation. It used to be the idea that you'd have 10,000 employees. That's no longer so. And you know who changed that? Not the leaders. The employees. Employees want flex time. So from flex time, you went from the brick and mortar idea, so the HR manual, and they can talk more to that, but the HR manual and the policies and the systems and the standards of an organization don't fit. Because now you've got somebody who's working 8 a.m. to 5 o'clock at night, and if they're five minutes late for work three times, they can be fired. But if you come over to the flex side, well, I can arrange meetings the way I want to. You see? So is it fair? Is policy fair? So leadership of an organization is changing. We need to think more about adapting. And this is where a lot of companies are looking at the contractual side of things. You can be an expert in your field. You need to be validated. So by being validated, you either work in these organizations and you've got the expertise and you've got the references and you know the information and how to adapt it to what you're doing for that company you're working for. Because if you're picked up, an example of this is Fiverr. Fiverr did a great job at a very elementary level. You can, do, you can put anything out there, it's five dollars, whatever, you whatever you're looking to achieve, and it's very, very cost effective. But the guarantee is that I get the stuff within a certain amount of time. That's what's happening in the business world. So people who are developing business plans, or they're looking for marketing plans, or they're looking for operational plans, they're looking for expansion plans, they're looking for new ideas. We're past the idea of consultants. It's everybody now. And you have the opportunity in boundaryless organizations to really embrace that and position yourself for the next round of development of companies. And it's a good place to be, I think. Um, really, I think so all that you said actually sounded like music in my ears because that's the kind of work I do back at office. But let me, let me spend some time talking about the Indian landscape, right? Uh, so what ends up happening, you know, you, you know, Rick spoke about work from home, he spoke about uh, virtualization, he spoke about technology. Today, a manager is going to say, I want my team members to be below my nose, exactly monitoring what he is doing, how long is he going for a coffee break? How long is he going for a smoke break? And what's the turnaround? With a mindset like that, and when I spoke about mindset as well, with a mindset like that, how on earth are you going to implement a market as an organization? Change is a beautiful thing. Um, at some point, we have to embrace it. There, you just won't make it in these kind of organizations if you have the traditional mindset. There's lots of traditional companies out there for people to work in. They're not going away overnight. Boundaryless organizations are cutting, they're faster, they're more malleable, almost to a point where I want to call them organic, but not organic in the sense that you don't 
uh, have the structure or DNA of the traditional organization. Managers are going to be the test in boundaryless organizations because the idea is, is that it's very two-way information. It's a give and a take, and you have to rely on the people that you're talking to. The age-old idea of the dynamics of corporate structures, it was very competitive. The next guy wanted the top job. He wanted the managerial job. He wanted the vice president's job. So in those environments, you get this backstabbing and all kinds of politics in an organization. In a boundaryless organization, it's actually quite easy, because if we're having a problem with a particular teammate, it's simple. I just remove them. So they put, put them on another project. It's easier to orchestrate things and to achieve things, but you're always coming down to the trust factor. And this is really what companies should have been doing years ago, because it's actually more of a social responsibility approach to humanity and kindness to another man uh, or lady or I don't want to get into that subject. In this space, you're going to find you have to be very willing, and that makes a lot of people a bit of afraid because you put your boundaries up. And this is the irony of boundaryless organizations. It's also the boundaries that people have. You have to break them down if you're going to fit in this. Sure, fantastic. Let me stand on your question. Where does change begin? I know there is a challenge. Where does the change begin? If it doesn't start from the top, how can I, at the bottom of the pyramid, about an institutional very good question. Uh, let me take an example. Probably a decade or 10 years back, HP was a very well-known name in the desktop. So they had a peculiar challenge. So if you keep your laptop and desktop at that point of idle, it used to heat up very fast, which also means it used to accelerate the decay of their internal parts, which means that life of that particular desktop would reduce and it get hits up very fast. So they're trying to solve the issues. So they discussed a lot of things, but nobody was bothered because the HP research team was doing much more intelligent stuff and the actual research team was not very really bothered to address uh, this kind of a thermal issue. So what they did, HP, they followed an approach which is in, uh, in a particular term known as positive deviant, which is identifying a person, a normal employee, who does things radically different. So there was a young person in HP who used to known for doing things a little differently. He was identified as a positive deviant and asked to work on this issue. So what he did is, instead of doing the normal project management and, and all those kind of step journeys, he actually collaborated with similar set of people having similar thought process across the different geographies of uh, HP and helped in coming up with a solution for this thermal challenge that HP was facing. And it came up with a solution which make HP very famous in its ability to address this thermal heating up for desktops for a generation. So that is how organization sometimes helps in addressing issues through a bottom-up approach. Instead of a top-down where a research giant or the research head would lead the issue and solve it, but here it was a normal employee having an interest in it, make him the cause of it, make him win the battle, make him do all the collaboration, and make him reach the success. And that is how he drive the entire change, the HP for an example. So that is one example I thought could be very relevant uh, to the exercise. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, let me stand for us to Vinay. Vinay, in your two decades of experience, uh, would you like to share some instances of how you really encountered change and how you want to the entire process, more from an operational perspective? So today, if I'm joining the workforce tomorrow, and I'm faced with a challenge like that, how do I bring about that change? Uh, I'll give a couple of examples from my uh, previous assignment. Uh, but before that, um, the famous uh, president of uh, United States, Woodrow Wilson, said, if you want to make enemies, please try, try to change something. <laughs> so when I was uh, in telecom company and we were uh, implementing SAP, SAP in HR, and uh, we were uh, having an uh, old uh, legacy system which was uh, implemented by TCS, and people were very comfortable operating out of that legacy system. Uh, we spent whole uh, one year implementing SAP. 
uh, that point of time uh, the two important thing which i have not uh, you know noticed or implemented is the resistance a lot of resistance among employees who are the users to adapt to this sap and some of them try to sabotage uh, this project and i have uh, no qualms in uh, accepting that the project was a failure that point of in 2004 i'm talking about so for any change initiative two things are very important how to resist change and there is a staggering data you know 75% of any uh, it project fails and that's fails because the concept of change or the problem in implementation uh, more often than not the problem is in implementation and uh, you know getting through the resistance how to influence who are the people who are the key players to map and make them change to you know adopt to the change so any change initiative how to counter the resistance is very very important second uh, examples my my previous company uh, uh, a very senior president corporate strategy joined uh, he came with the manifesto uh, like he was coined as a term like we said change agent a uh, uh, great change agent is coming he has a stint in a, a big uh, global uh, consulting organization he came to a very very traditional organization which is runs by a promoter and he is try to change everything from the day one he joins and believe me he has to leave the organization within 6 months so what went wrong because he has not his vision was not us his vision was my vision and i am trying to change everything so whenever these two examples are very staggering examples of you know the change process failure so next uh i think you want to talk about i think change be resistant yeah I have a single question on Twitter as yet. I think I have no questions. So your question is not allowed on Twitter. Live example, we're talking about change right here. When was the last time you went to a conference and you asked a question to the panelists on Twitter, right? And if we are going to the future workforce, and if we are going to resist change, how easy or how difficult it will be? Three. Let me come to you. Uh, you spent time in an advertising agency, yeah. and you had digital marketing. Uh, yeah, that's a little more of the kind of manuals that you hire, because anybody who gets into advertising has to choose to believe our guys who are happy out there, right? Uh, and they have different ideas. Now, if you shut somebody down, and you only meet one person, and we get into the corporate world, we have a bunch of ideas. If you as a management shut the idea down, I don't really believe this is an organization that is not open to change. But at the same time, if I come into an organization like Linux and I want to implement change at the rate of six months, I don't understand the system, I don't understand the organization, and suddenly I want to bring about a lot of change, I will be shown the door because the management will expect me to at least understand the place, figure out what's happening here, and then bring about the incremental change. So my question to you is. How do you play that balancing act? So the very fundamental in hiring for a new agency is start the contrast from how you are in the agency. So you can hire a company to hire for hire for the decision of how you are going to hire for the decision. But and another thing you are doing is we work with multiple branches at the same time. So if you are hiring a copy, you can hire the right subject in one branch. So So today we are working on the technology brand. Tomorrow we are launching a tire brand. Day after we are launching a industrial grade machine that does some, uh, you know, chemical coating on the capsule. So how do you write? How do you bring creativity into something that has value? So the secret behind hiring great people in advertising is they are able to learn. So when they are able to learn, actually that's the number one reason most people are creating businesses which are which doesn't have process or structures. No process or structure to creative job like that. So the only success behind those is they learn pretty fast. So uh, we're talking about how fever dot com changes and how you know technology changes. So in, in my recent visit uh, to uh, Silicon Valley, I, I generally have a conversation with uh, Uber drivers. 
we find great insights whether it's in India or somewhere. So the girl driving it, I just had conversation saying, hey, what do you do uh, for a living? So she said, uh, I study in Stanford. She's studying in Stanford and she's driving Uber in the evening just to make a rent. Right? So that's the different kind of mindset. It's extremely unfortunate that we don't emulate such uh, uh, mindset here at all. Students find it, uh, I've seen this resistance, especially for the first time when come, uh, when they're hiring for the first time, right? Uh, you, may be in a, you may be graduating from a really, really good management program, you may have cases in your uh, CV and your mark sheet, yes. That only gets you till an interview, but why you get hired is for a skill, right? And this ability to learn and to try to do different things, for example, if, if, if you have a uh, line in a CV that says, I used to deliver pizzas when I was studying. That's a really interesting way somebody is going to look at look into you. Then you say, I did one more um, college project work that's like spinal bone and somewhere in the library. So, uh, when we are talking about minerals and the so, and you ask how she, where does this all begin, where does this all this change begin? So, it, 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 it is everything to do with people and in, in fact, some of, you know, most of the time you see people want the boundary. I mean, what do I mean by that is that's not my job. That's where the boundary is set. Right? So sometimes people set it for themselves. So that's not my job. Oh, why am I doing it? I do not know. It's, and, and there is the shyness factor. When you do not know something and when you know you are grossly incompetent, you are extremely fear of failing to try something new and fail in it because your reputation is, is kind of dependent on it and people may laugh at you or something like that. So you are kind of resisting to trying something new. Like any Fantastic, and it's two very great points to this of that discussion. Uh, Rick, let's get some perspective from you on uh, just getting an understanding of why would employees want a brownie organization? I'm just trying to clear the question just to see. We all have been discussing about boundary less since morning, right? If I want less of boundaries, I will be initiated. But if I want a boundary in place, just to draw the line to cover my incompetence and say my job stops here and I'm not open to change because that's my own inadequacy. How do I put up that facade? So traditional brick and mortar companies, um, y you, can, you can hide. It's called trimming the fat, essentially, in the world that I come from. Uh, once a year, you do your budgets and you slowly uh, find out that you're overstaffed and things like that, and you s slowly start letting people go, layoffs begin. Um, when you're looking at boundaryless organizations, uh, you gotta perform. And if you really want to be successful in a boundaryless organization, uh, you perform all the time because now you become someone who can be counted on. If you think about the A team of top level companies, regardless of the industry, aviation is a great one because when you get into the world of aviation, you find out very quickly if you don't follow processes and systems, you're gone. Well, I was working for the guys who made those systems and I was a development of those systems. So you get quickly understand when you have 172 people doing something, every single thing has to be perfect because it's lives at stake. So regardless of the type of job that you get into in a boundaryless organization, you play that role. You have to be dependable, you have to know your content, you have to be an expert, and you will be very, very successful. Um, that's pretty much the difference between the two. Stay in a brick and mortar, um, you face the opportunity that one day you'll face that layoff. Super, great, Eric. Uh, who's the insomniac? Can you put your hand up? Wherever you are, oh, fantastic. Can we give a huge round of applause for the insomniac, please? And the reason we give an applause is because the first question comes from him on Twitter. And the question is to all my panelists Is there really a fixed formula for changing culture in a boundaryless organization? And uh, insomniac, I give you the opportunity. Do you want to direct this question to any particular panelist, or are you open? Okay. I will go for this. Great. See, the, most of the time when we say collaboration and boundaryless, the way people start seeing, even within two departments, is like how a cricket fanatic is arguing with a soccer or a football fanatic. Which level is the best and which game is more difficult, why it is the best, and so on and so forth. They are never going to be in an argument. Both of them. The right way to look at this is how you see an army and a navy. 
both have unique skill set, operate in different environments, do different things. But at the time of combat, they have a coordinated strategy of attack and that's how they will right? So if an organization wants to achieve something, it doesn't matter whether it is men's team, women's team, opponent's team, finance team, it doesn't matter any of those things. Right? What matters is respecting each other's skill set and that is the secret. Respect other skill set. You don't know Excel, no problem. You are not expected to know Excel. Find, work with someone who is good at it. You know something else, be happy about it, be proud about it, but don't show it off. Right? So because every other person in the organization has a skill set that we don't have. And then each colleague is respective of other skill and both of them are working in the same to make something happen. That's the eraser that takes the boundary off. Brilliant. I think so. Uh, she summarized it pretty well. If you close them back home, what we do at KPMG is essentially we're running a purpose known as the higher purpose campaign. Every single employee of the firm is committed to their own higher purpose. And if you're connected to your own higher purpose, which is in sync with the organization's higher purpose, then it's not about your role, my role, your strength, my weakness. It's all about saying, can we get together? And can we, as a team, be the first choice for our clients? That essentially is the higher purpose. As I summarize, I will request each of my panelists to give me five words, yeah? And they're all looking at me amazed because they haven't really prepared for this. So they're also equally stunned. Five words that you think would be the first five words that would come to your mind on today's topic. Five unique words that would come to your mind when you think of the topic employee as a change agent in a boundaryless organization. Just five words, each panelist. I'm so sorry to put you in this spot, but I'm saying let's get the best out here. Come on. I will not give you five words, uh, but few sentences. <laughs> okay, <laughs> few sentences about uh, boundaryless organization. Yeah, a boundaryless organization is the future. Uh, the amount of uh, digitization happening, and next two three years, the boundary is going to you know go go away. And point two is. Um, the employees at the centricity of uh, any change management. Without the employees, you can't do any change management. And third is uh, change is a journey, not destination. That's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, the digitization is going to lead us to the cognitive uh, management. Yeah. And fifth is. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, fifth, I will say. Uh, the change management has been there for last 50 years as a management subject. In spite of that, 75% of the any transformation change management things fail. The problem is in implementation, problem is with the managerial competence. The concepts, fundamentals like Cotter's eight success factor or uh, Prosky's uh, Edgar model, the models are all there, but implementation is the key. Fantastic. Rick, that's only five words. Five words. Change. Uh, you got to be prepared for change. Um, be a learner, uh, someone who adapts. Um, be resourceful. Um, have a great personality. Personality is going to impact whether or not you get hired. Um, and believe in yourself. Fantastic. Believe in yourself. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so when I'm looking at summarizing it, the first thing that comes into mind, if you're looking for someone else to drive the change, then it's not going to happen. You have to yourself drive the change. You first. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I will still go with some sentences. Uh, it makes my life a little easier. Uh, second thing is that, yes, first as I said, you have to drive your own change. So you have to be the driver. Second is that there is no panacea for all the different silos or boundaries that you're talking about. I mean, a lot of people today talk about digital 
as if it's the panacea for every silo? No, it's not. Right? Third, mindset. I think that has been stressed upon uh, by all of the speakers. Fourth, go out of your books. You will read organizational behavior theories and all those which I also read during my management. And to go out of the book, practice change only to ensure that you can actually make change happen. And fifth, be confident on yourself and be collaborative with others. That's the only two ways to make a success happen. That was a great comment, I must say. Well done. So, Sri, you always have the final word. Final words. So, first and foremost, embrace change. It's really good because change is progressive. Be collaborative. So, like I said, respect others. Sure. Create a conducive environment for others to work with you. And uh, be cooperative. And one last. Hit the nail in the head. Give me the one last word. Not the word I want to hear, but your word. There's one thing that they all want to hear. Yeah. The lunch is here. <laughs> okay, okay. I got just a word for you. Yeah. Copy from someone who is doing great collaborations. There's no shame in it. Okay, great, wonderful. So I have two questions here from Master and Prashant. But I will take them up in the second panel because fortunately I'm on the moderation for the second panel as well. So I promise both of you, I will take those questions up in the second panel. Can I have a huge round of applause for all my panelists, please? Thank you. Thank you.